The recording started too, and now there are still no attendees though. Uh, oh, that's just recording. There is the get rid of the practice session. We're no longer in practice session. I, it doesn't say that on mine anymore. What's this practice uh, session? Oh, I said, just... let's start the, oh. the webinar. I hit oh. start. Okay. It then, said it oh, was recording. It says and eight George participants. George raised his hand. Yes. Oh, here's Good. a bunch of people. Okay, let's yes. go. Now that they're here, um, promote. Ashley, promote. Uh, Rob, promote. Okay. Is everyone coming? Yep, I see Ashley. Uh, let me see who else I see. Uh, I see Rob. Rovers and Allegra is here. Okay, and in the and here's Grover. Promote. And as attendees, we have George Ryan, our note taker, John Hornick, Laura Baker, and Tim from Craig's Doors. Great. Now George's hand is down, so I assume. Everything's okay. Yeah, maybe he was. I, when I first clicked on attendees, I couldn't see anybody. Maybe he was just telling me there were people there that I didn't notice. And uh, <laughs> hello and welcome. Nate is uh, will be joining us a little bit late. So we're trying to do the Zoom techie part that he usually does. Thank you. We, for have, mm -hmm. we have a quorum, so. Great. Okay, well, thank you for your patience and thank you for letting um, Carol and I um, get you all into being panelists and being part of the meeting. Uh, it is 7.02, July 13th, the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust meeting has started and it is being recorded. So just to remind everybody that this is being recorded. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, we're gonna go ahead and start with our first item on the agenda, which is the review of the minutes from June from the June meeting. Um, so is there anybody who has any additions, corrections, comments? And I'll just give a few minutes. Not seeing anybody's hands up or coming off mute. We will go ahead and accept the minutes as they stand and thank George Ryan for doing the minutes for tonight. So we will now go to the next item on the agenda. Um, the next item on the agenda, uh, it was our, our June 20th uh, listening session on affordable housing. Um, so let me start, but I would uh, love to have my uh, co planners to also um, jump in, uh, as well as those of you who came that evening. So let me just start. Um, we, uh, with the Community Safety and Social Justice uh, Committee, we actually planned this. Uh, and so Allegra being the chair and Philip also from that committee, uh, Human Rights Committee, uh, Philip Avela and Liz Haygood. Uh, health Department was Nancy Gilbert from our Housing Trust, Ashley Allegra and me. Uh, and then from the town, Jennifer Moyston and Nate. Um, so we were um, able to pull the uh, in-person meeting together. We had over 40 people attend the meeting and representation really was very, very diverse in terms of uh, people who were unhoused or who were, um, in, uh, who were being sheltered to homeowners, to renters, um, to individuals who really um, have lived experience with challenges with affordable rental as well as affordable um, uh, owning a home or staying in a home um, as well as advocates um, were there. Um, so we right now um, are in the process of pulling a report together um, and unfortunately I haven't had a time to get it completed but um, we had a, over 20 people submit their comments and uh, unclear if uh, some of those people were there or not. Um, we were very clear that we want to um, ensure anonymity, which we will continue to do so. Um, but um, we really had a range of themes 
uh, and I don't think it will surprise you. We've discussed many of the themes here, uh, just in terms of um, for our last planning meeting where we sort of debriefed some of the high level themes that came out of this uh, that would not surprise you is um, looking at um, ways that we can encourage um, more affordable housing through possible density, change of zoning regulations, um, uh, enforcing regulations that exist now around rentals um, and around um, student housing, uh, reducing regulations that delay development um, or impact the development of affordable housing, subsidies for individuals for uh, rentals, affordable rentals, as well as for um, uh, buying houses, so um, incentives for or subsidies for um, actually able to, to buy a home or uh, provide a mortgage for it, incentives to developers uh, to develop affordable housing and to maintain affordable housing versus um, that that then changes, uh, engaging with developers and also then um, thinking about uh, how to address working with UMass to increase uh, housing on campus or creating housing on campus. Um, there are lots of nuances in between, so I'm gonna stop here and ask um, my colleagues who were there that evening, um, if they want to also just uh, provide some highlights of what they might have heard um, to be some of the issues. Go ahead, Ashley. Well, so at my table, I, you know, I talked to a person that was not housed. I think they are actually staying at um, Craig's door right now, amongst others, of course. And I was struck by how hard the process is. Um, particularly if you don't have housing at all. Um, and I know because of being on the, the trust, but also because I went through the experience, you know, three months of rent of moving into a place that costs $1,100 is $3,300. And to think a homeless person is going to get $3,300 to be able to live in Amherst is a very high bar. It is it is hard, and I have a job for me to like save thirty three hundred dollars. The process is so hard. The bar is so high, and the rent is still three times as much as like most people that need housing can really afford. We're still making very expensive affordable housing with the bar so high that a lot of people are just not going to make it. And so that part of the process, we don't bring up a lot. It's just too hard for a lot of people to ever get to. Thank you, Ashley. Um, Rob Allegra, you were there as well. Um, I was at a table um, with somebody who spoke of her experience and she's in an affordable unit right now and the number of people in her family is five and the number of bedrooms that they have is two and so just thinking even though the person has affordable affordable housing at this point it's inadequate for the needs of that particular family and the size of the family and um so i i think that and i think ashley kind of thought that this might come up before the meeting thinking about like what about people who have housing and it's not enough you know it's not adequate for them and so it, it did come up um and it was interesting because you know you don't want to lose the affordability but that's you know they're they're not just going to add a bedroom to your unit um and unless somebody moves out of a three bedroom it's really hard to find something in that size. So, I, you know, I was, it made me think again about in terms of looking at some of the projects that we have coming down the road, what are the bedroom size mixes going to be? And, and can we look at, is, is there a way to influence in our conversation with, you know, Wayfinders or Valley CDC or whoever's doing some of the various projects about, you know, maybe we need three, you know, a few more three bedroom units because there might be families who really need that size unit. Um, so that was that was a big thing that came up and my group talked a lot about rent control. And one of the reasons that that came up was because somebody in my group's rent had gone up, I think it was 39% from one year to the next. Um, and again, to the point where 
they had to think about, are we downsizing to a smaller unit because we can't afford this? Um, so it was, I mean, I, I know that rent has been going up, but to hear that stark number was really um, it was eye-opening for me. Um, and even just talking, you know, I had a person who was a homeowner in my group and the, you know, they said they're, you know, they have a mortgage and you would think, oh, I have a mortgage, it's gonna be pretty stable. But the way that Amherst taxes have continued to go up and up and up, it's not been so stable. <laughs> um, so that was, you know, I think, I think the cost was a big thing and the size, those were two big things that I took away from my group. Grover, do you wanna add anything? You named it in your list, Erica, but really the tension of university and student housing was live in a number of ways at our table. And we had a student who was there who, one thing he named was that even when apartments are listed as available or listed as a two bedroom, when he calls there, not actually available or they're renting them out by room even though it says that they're available for the apartment and that he said that this included sometimes the housing that was listed by the university so it's just really showing to or that illustrated to me that whatever data even we scrape offline might not like is less accurate than even I would think and I'm fairly skeptical um and really that the university housing and housing students piece is still very much there, not just for what it does to the whole market economy, but also for individual students. Thank you. Um, Rob or Nate, do you wanna add anything? Yeah, I, I, I think um, for me, the value in the event was, was just um, having people sit down and talk about um, you know what what the issues are around affordability. Um, you know it's it's one thing to hear a report or read a report or, or you know to to talk about it amongst ourselves, but but um, to talk to hear people who who aren't um, routinely engaged with it like we are. Um, you know, everyone has a has a different story, a different angle on 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 what makes something unaffordable, or 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 what they would like to see, and 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 um, having people hear from others, I think, um, just raises awareness, and I think that that was um, helpful to me. I think you know, it's I, I was I wasn't really sure what to expect from the event, but it seems like something that. You know, if it happens, you know, annually or even more regularly, it, it might be useful for, you know, the more people know about the issue, um, the more likely they're, they are to be willing to think about it or to be receptive to proposals. Yeah, I want to piggyback on that. In, in my group, something that stood out for me was, you know, we can come up with solutions, but if we don't talk to individuals who we think the solutions impact, we miss things. So for example, there was an individual who talked about, it is so, so hard to get a voucher. But when you get a voucher, you can't find a place and then they expire. So we think the solution is, okay, vouchers. And then what we don't see if we don't talk to individuals who experience this or advocates who are working with individuals who are trying to get this, one is we don't even understand the, the sort of, constant high bar of even trying to get one but once you do get one and you can't find a place they expire and the person's not housed and it's just the, the hopes are there about being housed and then they can't get housed uh, and so it, it's so important to be listening to individuals and we had a spectrum of individuals who were you know either looking for a place to be housed or unhoused uh, and, and the struggles and the amount of energy it takes to address these housing issues, um, it's it just is so, it, it's hard. It's really hard and we need to do a better job. And I think, you know, some of the, 
the recommendations that um, I think we're not going to be surprised at the recommendations, but I think it really gives us an opportunity to think about some priorities and where we can make some dents in this. Um, but it is, it is complex. Um, and it is so important that we constantly go back to people and hear their experiences and how things are working or not working. Oh, so the next steps in this is um, pulling all of this together uh, and then sharing it uh, far and wide. Um, it's going to go through, you know, the planning group first, just to make sure um, the planning group feels that, you know, um, that the voices of the individuals who participated, uh, and there was a range, you know, absolute range of individuals who participated, um, is you know is coming through this. And so we're going to include quotes again. Um, that there's nothing in any of our notes that um, would identify individuals, um, but we really think it'd be important to have quotes in here straight from individuals who participated. Uh, so once we you know share the report, I mean, I think for us in terms of the um, affordable housing trust, it's a good basis for thinking about our strategic planning and our next steps, but it's also a, a really good opportunity to then think about how to collaborate with others uh, in areas that are identified uh, where we can actually do that, either by amplifying some of the advocates who are working on these issues or legislation that John's gonna talk about. Um, there are just so many opportunities to really try to make a dent in increasing affordable housing uh, and for the things that do exist to make them work. Okay, so anybody else, questions, comments, feedback? Go ahead, Ashley. Just real quick, I mean, about that thing, like basically you can get a voucher, but then you can't even afford what the rent would be even when the voucher is paying for two thirds of it and the person is paying one thirds of it. So all up the ladder from a person that actually has the section eight, they can't find anything affordable. And then people who are sometimes couples have, you know, good incomes and the starting prices of houses are 500,000 and 600,000. So it's like from the most bottom person, not finding a room or an apartment to two professional people, not being able to find a starter home. Amherst is unaffordable for every level of human being. And that's why 25 year olds, 49 year olds are not living here. It's like, there's no point. You can't afford anything if you're 25 to 49. You almost have to have had a house for 20 or 30 years to live here or find a tax credit apartment, which I was lucky to find, but there's like 10 of those. It's not like, there's not hundreds, you know? So Amherst is unaffordable for just about everyone. Thank you, Ashley. So we have to think about how we turn this around. Grover has a hand up. Oh, thank you. Grover. Uh, one thing that I um, I just wanted to say and know it as we move into what's next is that I noticed in my conversation and it's, you know, uh, I think Rob alluded to it, the different understandings of what affordable is was very live and even people feel passionately about even that affordable isn't affordable right like the the word itself is is both confusing and tense and you know housing justice advocates all over the country have been dealing with this it's not just us here but also there's there was a way like I think we were like three quarters through the conversation when somebody said, oh, actually rent control is not legal in the state of Massachusetts. And so there's also, there's just a public um, education aspect that I think will have to accompany any next thing that we put out. And part of it I it might be like us on this, in this group. And it, it's like concentric circles of understanding, like, are, are we talking about the same things? And do we even understand what's possible? Like are there resources that are already exist that we could be like in the state of Massachusetts, this is possible and this is not possible. Like currently rent control is not possible. Currently this department provides funding for this, right? Like something that will even just show the pathways of possibility. 
because I think people get into contentious conversations, but they don't even necessarily have a shared understanding or are talking about solutions that are currently possible or not possible. And then that will help us identify what policies we might look to change or what resources we might utilize to make the changes that we're hoping for. So. Thank you, Grover. I, I did note that in one of the submitted, um, or either it was uh, in one of the notes that someone suggested instead of affordable, attainable. Um, uh, and in looking at you know the, the plus 20 uh, submissions, you're right, there was a range. Um, I think only very few people, there was one person who actually said 25% of the income um, and others you know, said 30%, but it was really about a diverse thriving community of uh, families and individuals who could afford to live in Amherst and still be able to afford the needed things such as uh, how, uh, food and, uh, and clothing, et cetera. So yes, I think that's a very, very good point. And, then, and I think it also might help us with our strategic plan as well. If we're clear about what the pathways are, then we can better think about what we want to prioritize in those pathways. And then um, we do have as part of our last strategic plan, a whole um, goal around educating community members. All right, just want to make sure no other hands are up. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for um, contributing to, you know, how you experienced this in the highlights. Um, I, I don't think I, I started with the themes, but I didn't do justice to really the, the wonderful, I think, human conversation that was so important for us to hear and um, to really think about. Okay. I'm going to move to the next item on the agenda, and I have a pleasure of uh, having Rob um, give a presentation on the Amherst Community Land Trust, um, which is also another um, option for us to consider with regard to um, how we can promote affordable housing. So, Rob, I'm going to turn it to you. Okay. Um, can I um, share my screen? Is that a possibility? Nate has to make you host. We have to make you a co-host and then you can, which. Uh, hey Rob, if you just try as a panelist, you should be able to, unless I have to change it. Um, does host was stable. Um, go for it. Did I, did I, it's disabled? Yes. <laughs> it has, oh, all right, hold on a minute. Try it again, I just made you a co-host. Oh, there we go. I think, so yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to, to talk about um, one of the things that I do. Um, first of all, I, I should um, emphasize that, that this is, as Erica said, this is just one possible um, element of, of, a, of a large strategy. There are many things that need to be done. And, and uh, this is a small part of it. It's something that I'm ha happen to be interested in. Um, and so I'm happy to share uh, what, what, uh, what this is all about. So um, what does ACLT stand for? for? It stands for Amherst Community Land Trust. Um, uh, CLT is is a community land trust. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization. Um, we're we're like a conservation land trust in that in that we're formed to permanently hold land. But in the case of a CLT, the land is held not for uh, ecological purposes or to provide a place for um, passive recreation, but it's to it's to provide social or economic benefits for uh, the wider community. For most CLTs, that means affordable housing and specifically home ownership. But it can be many other things, including affordable rentals, community gardens, even commercial buildings. Uh, the North Amherst Community Farm is a kind of community land trust. It's a single property community land trust. The Amherst Community Land Trust is, is focused on affordable home ownership. And how that works is, um, 
when when a house is sold, you're just buying the house. You're not buying um, the land value of it. So so the price is reduced because you're not buying the entire package. However, so the goal the goal is is um, to remove the house from the speculative marketplace, make it affordable. Um, it also allows the homeowner to to build equity over time. It's not you're not renting. You actually you actually own the property. Um, and and so you own the CLT owns the land. The homeowner buys the house at a lower price than they, they would if they had to buy the whole thing. And the house comes with a 99 year ground lease. So it, in other words, you have you have use of that land forever, basically. Um, the resident has the ground lease provides um, full use of the land and gives the resident most of the benefits and responsibilities of home ownership. They have to maintain the property. They have to pay property taxes. And they can extract equity when they sell the house. On the restriction side, most CLTs will require owner occupancy, as as the Amherst Community Land Trust does. So, in other words, you can't you can't buy a house and then uh, rent it. However, you 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 can buy a house um, and then stay there, even if you have even if you start earning a lot more, um, you're no longer considered uh, a low income person. You, it's your house. You can own it. You can pass it on to your children. You can sell it to somebody else. However, there are limits on um, the amount that you can sell the house for. There's a limit on the appreciation. So the resale price is is limited to the original purchase price plus part of the appreciation. Now the the CLTs have various ways of 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 crediting uh, appreciation. Our formula uh, allows the price to rise at the same rate as the area median income. So that means that if a house is a, is affordable for someone at eighty percent, which is you know the the highest level of of capital A affordable, it's supposed to be continue to be available at the eighty percent level into the future. So whatever the price is sold at, that's, that will still be at 80% affordability. Eligible buyers have to be income qualified. So they, so um, as I said, you can, you can buy the house um, at, a, at whatever your, whatever the house is restricted to 80% or 60% or whatever. Um, you can grow out of that, but the house stays um, at, at that level for successive home buyers. Our business model, um, well, I, I should say, first of all, some CLTs are, are designed to be developers. In other words, they, they acquire land and then and then build and sell affordable houses. Others, like ACLT, acquire existing homes apply a subsidy or, or otherwise reduce the price and then and then sell the house. Within that model, um, there are multiple strategies for acquiring homes and we've we've already used uh, several that I'll um, go through in a minute. In order to um, accomplish our mission, we actually have we, we had to rely on partnerships with with um, a number of organizations uh, throughout the town, throughout the valley. It's 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 not something that we can possibly do on our own. Um, the ones, the more prominent ones that we've worked with so far: North Amherst Community Farm, Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity, Valley Community Development, and of course the town. So, what projects have we done so far? Um, we're we're a little less than ten years old. Um, our first house was our first project was um, a duplex on North Pleasant Street, carved out of out of the North Adams Community Farm, that Habitat built. So they built two affordable homes. Um, our next one was 
a CPA funded project to provide a subsidy to purchase a home. Uh, Valley CD uh, identified potential um, buyers, um, income qualified them, uh, oriented them to the to the program, conducted a lottery to choose someone who could take um, our subsidy, go find a house, and and buy it with with um, our money and 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 their their money. And that are the first project there. Um, found a house in River Valley on Tracy Circle. Our next home was actually uh, be bequeathed to us. Um, our founding president um, gave her house, lock, stock, and barrel to ACLT when she passed. And so we were able to, to um, it, it's a house on Beston Street, right in the heart of, of, of Amherst Center. Um, we sold that house at a, a price well below what the market would have borne for that house. Um, to just someone who could not otherwise afford to live in Amherst. The next one was um, a house on Logtown Road that uh, someone who heard about uh, Amherst Community Land Trust and was interested in, in the model. They they had been renting it to somebody. That person they they agreed to sell their that house to their tenant at a below market price and donate the land value to, to ACLT. So now that house is, is within our portfolio um, and it will be affordable going forward. And then our the next um, project was also on Beston Street, a homeowner who is currently in their house, voluntarily entered into a ground lease with us, permanently restricting their resale price also to uh, something that is um, capital A affordable below 80% income, foregoing uh, the appreciation that that house has, has um, attained over, over many years. So our current project is actually a continuation or um, ongoing part of, of our the house that um, we, we got on Tracy Circle. That CPA funding actually two subsidies, two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars subsidies for someone to go out and buy a home um, at at a price that they couldn't otherwise afford. At the time um, we submitted the application, that seemed like enough to for someone to to find a home and and uh, buy it. However, um, in the intervening years. The housing market has has continued to um, skyrocket. In order for a home to be affordable at, at eighty percent AMI, a family of three should um, should be looking at something that's no more than uh, should should be spending no more than one hundred sixty thousand dollars. Which means, with one hundred twenty five thousand dollars subsidy, they'd have to be looking for a two hundred eighty five thousand dollars home. But there are no homes available for that amount in Amherst anymore. It doesn't happen. And so we haven't been able to, to match a homeowner and a home um, because of the market. So we've taken uh, $75,000 that, that we, um, part, of, part of the money that we got from selling the first house on Besson Street, we're adding it to our subsidy. So that, that the amount available is now two hundred thousand dollars, and the target home price is is around three hundred and sixty for a family of three. That's that's more realistic, but it's still rare. There's still not that many homes uh, available for that amount in Amherst. So anyone who who qualifies at at the eighty percent level who's listening, or you, or if you know of anyone, and and um. You know, we have we have money available for you for for you to buy a house, a home, and we'd love to be able to to partner with you. This is our our uh, um, flyer that that Valley CD made. The way it works is is you you would go through Valley CD. They would help you um, 
qualify, um, help you fill out the application, and and then um, and then then we would work with you to, to find the hall. So in summary, um, we have five properties, counting six homes, one of which is a duplex, and we have one pending. How much does that cost? We've gotten about three hundred sixty thousand dollars from CPA and $840,000 in, in um, private sources. That's people donating their home or part of their home or donating money so that we can we can apply it to, to um, home purchases. That's a lot of money um, and it's still not nearly enough. What does the, what does the future hold for us? So based on our experience, um, we're going to focus on property donations um, as our primary means of acquisition, at least for the, for the near term. We think that there's um, a lot of people out there who, who, who are, would be interested in um, giving their home or, or giving away some value. In fact, um, going back to, our, to the, uh, the listening session that we had, one of the things that we talked about in the end was was this idea that that homes, you know, grow in value, and they and it's not really anything that you've done; they just grow, and and, and so you suddenly have all this value that you didn't really earn. Um, if you can, if you can um, wrap your mind around that, and 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 don't have um, people that you need to to you know heirs or whatever that or or health problems that you need to sell your house, if you can afford to give away part of your value, then and this is a way of, of, of um, contributing to, to fixing or, or, or at least one small part of, of the housing crisis. Put your house in, in, the, in the land trust. Um, anyone who's listening is, and is interested in that, um, you know, I'd be happy to talk with you about it. We do hope to occasionally supplement with um, future CPA funding or, or funding from the housing trust. Um, we don't have any projects in mind, but um, you know, I hope that's not uh, off the table. And the other thing that we're working on is is developing a repair and replacement reserve fund to assist uh, our homeowners with capital improvements. Affordability doesn't stop at buying the house. Um, you have to take care of it. You have to you have to put on a new roof. You have to um, replace the furnace and so on. And those things are not cheap. Um, so, so we're 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 trying to raise money to to um, um, provide a fund for for people to to uh, um, manage those kinds of expenses. And that's it. Um, I'm happy to take questions if anyone has them. And, and uh, thank you for your time. Any questions for Rob? Rob, I have a question. Um, when you talked about land acquisition, um, you could also just get land and then work with like Habitat for Humanities and they'll build on the land. It doesn't necessarily need to have a home and land at the same time, right? That's right, yes. Mm -hmm. Yep, many CLTs do have that as their primary model. And we did that for our first project. Um, there's not a lot of land around that people are willing to to go away but yeah that's that's yeah we would love to work with habitat again yeah great. well i heard amherst college has some land <laughs> uh allegra um so i guess i just wanted to clarify because i know you'd written that um the homeowner would pay the property taxes but with the model I'm assuming that the property taxes would be less because they're not paying property taxes on the land. Would that be correct? That's right. Yes. Yeah. So pro the property tax is based on, on, on the market value of the home. Mm -hmm. And so what we've done is we've reduced the market value of the home. We restricted the resale price. And so that's, that's what your tax will be based on. Cool. Thank you. Um, Mara Keen has a hand up. A couple of people have hands up in the audience. Um, can we call on them? Is that okay with people? Um, let's see, what am I supposed to do? How do I just let somebody talk? Um, if you, you look up to the right, yep, yeah, okay. 
Mara, would you unmute yourself and say what you want to say? Yeah, I'm, I'm also a member of the Amherst Community Land Trust. And um, I just want to say that dues are $15 a year and anybody is welcome to join as long as they agree with the general concept. Um, and you can go to the web page and sign up. Um, we do have a, at least, I think, two general meetings a year, Rob, right? There's That's right. Coming up on July 29th. And then we have an annual membership meeting in, in December. Um, and um, anybody's welcome to attend the board meetings, which have been all online so far. So um, I'm hoping we can up our membership. It seems like this is a perfect way to join forces here since you guys on the housing trust do a lot with rental properties and um, we deal with owner occupied properties. Thank you, Maura. Um, and we, we, anyway, rental or home ownership, we're interested. Um, we're interested in the whole continuum from unhoused all the way to owning your own home. So thank you. Um, I think that's a great invitation for us uh, to consider. Um, I think the next person I'd like to speak is John. I just wanted to mention that there are two other mechanisms or organizations that assist people in reaching home ownership in Amherst. Um, one is Valley Community Development, which has a home ownership program that is subsidized by uh, Community Preservation Act funds. And in addition to that, I, Laura may speak about that later in this meeting, they have a development on Ball Lane, which is intended for people um, wishing to own their own home. Um, the other organization is Habitat for Humanity. And while they haven't had an Amherst project recently, I know that they'd love to have an, have an Amherst project if they had some land on which they could build. But they have historically built uh, affordable homes in Amherst. Thank you, John, for adding to this. Anybody else uh, from, thank you, Ashley, go ahead. Just, um, I just wanted to go over just a little bit of the economics and I, I you know, I totally believe you, but basically 80% of the area minimum um, income is about $64,000 for one person. And it's about $90,000 for a family of four. And so those people, should be spending approximately $160,000 on a house. And so there's no house like that. And that's, I'm, I'm, you know, using your data. And so there's no house that is even twice or three times that. So the 80% AMI person is not living in Amherst. I mean, they're not recently living in Amherst. They, that person might've lived here for 30 years, but there's just no way for like someone making $64,000 to like look at home prices or have a family of four at $90,000 and then want to live in Amherst. Cause I mean, they can't. So that's like the big economic picture of why the town is the way it is. Like, I think, I just want to address that in general, that people aren't buying homes here at 80% AMI in general. They're just, they, there's, there's no $160,000 place to buy. So we're, Amherst is not attracting that kind of person ever again, <laughs> probably. I mean, in our lifetime, that person is living somewhere else. Right. Big problem. But I think one of the things that you're proposing um, is thinking about that we might have to pool more monies together for subsidies to attract individuals and families to come into Amherst. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's hard because there's so many um, worthwhile projects. You know, I, I hate to say that that we deserve the money. We don't deserve the money any more than anyone else does. 
all there needs to be money for for all of these projects. Um, but yeah, in order to get in order to find um, home ownership um, opportunities for people in the sixty to eighty percent or even one hundred percent range, yeah, there's going to have to be an infusion of money or or donations of land or or property. Grover has her hand. Uh, Grove, you have the Grove. You have your hand up. Yeah. Thanks. Um, you know, at that price point um, with the added extra 75,000 you gave, there are a couple of apartments that I've seen listed that would fall within that, but apartments that the whole building is in, in the land trust then won't work for this model, correct? I'm, like I'm not sure just you're one saying apartment like a condo? In, a, in a building. Yeah, yeah, a condoized unit. The land trust model wouldn't work in that case unless the entire apartment building that's went right to join the land. Yes. Okay. Right. So it just makes me think possible strategy, and this is used in Oakland increasingly over the last decade, is um, shifting entire like have. Up. Yeah, didn't catch that. Land by an entire. We can hear you, Grover. Um, this makes me. You're breaking yeah. up a little bit, Grover. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. From yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it just makes me think that as we think about development and things like that, thinking about the benefits of building apartment buildings as in relationship with the land trust model, so that one piece of land might be four or five or, or 10 families, right? That are all then owners in the land trust and it's the unit that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that. Would co-housing be something that would also work? Yeah, I don't see why not. Co-housing co is, is a condo, I think, so. Yeah. 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 yeah, I think, Rover, you raise a good point. We have to think about all the different configurations. Um, I think the more, you know, tiny homes to condos to co-housing to individual homes um, are some of the things that, you know, can also be strategies. And, and to back to um, uh, John's point, you know, with um, Ball Lane being uh, an opportunity to develop affordable home ownership, you know, we have to look at it all to see where we can really provide um, different alternatives. But thank you, Rob. Um, yep. Just let me make sure that no one else has wants to say anything. Okay, um, thank you very, oh, I'm sorry, Maura, you still have your hand up? Did you want to add something? Yeah, I just want to say that um, with the, we're restricted to get to having homeowners that make 80% of AMI if we're using um, public funds like CPA or something like that. But for donated properties, the ceiling can be higher. It can be 100 or even 120,000 for it. So that would help some of the problem, Ashley, that you were talking about, um, giving it to those work, workforce housing. If, yeah, but that's public funds can't be used for that. Thank you, Maura. Okay, um, thank you very much, Rob. Um, that contributes to all the different opportunities that we can look at as part of strategies that we might wanna prioritize for um, the future. So thank you so much. And could we have your slides? It would be okay if you sent us the slides and we'll uh, include it as part of the minutes. Thank you. All right, Carol, I'm gonna turn it over to you. 
then I'm going to turn it over to John, who has got some legislative suggestions for us. So let's uh, bring John in. And I also think that if I don't mess up, I'm going to share his uh, the thing that he's going to talk about right there. Oops, I lost my whole self, though. Carol, I can share it. I have it ready. All right, go ahead. I've lost the whole screen by trying. <laughs> I did it before. <laughs> go for it. Okay, you're on, John. You're on mute, John. If you think you're speaking, we can't see you. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Can you see me? Sorry. Yes. Um, okay. So <clears throat> the biggest item that I have is still a little vague, but the governor is going to put forward a very large bond proposal, which is includes housing and other forms of economic development. Um, essentially, I should say that most of the, the state's budget is close to being settled. The legislature has yet to pass it and the governor has yet to sign it. But I think both the House and the Senate <clears throat> have their own separate budgets and it's a matter of the committees getting together and agreeing on what will be in the final budget. Uh, I make it sound so simple, but it's all supposed to happen <laughs> by July 1. And there have definitely been years that it doesn't happen by July 1. Nonetheless, the bond proposal that the governor is working on, and she has already offered a part of it, um, happens uh, somewhat outside the regular legislative budget. So the question is, why does that happen? Why do you need it? And how would Amherst benefit? Basically, a bond bill is like any other kind of mortgage. Um, the governor has decided in this case, let's say with respect to housing, that there's not enough in <clears throat> money in the state budget to pay for the development that's needed given the huge shortage of housing in the state. So what can the governor do? Well, in this case, she can propose to basically spend a lot of money that the state doesn't have. That is that is not part of current revenues or revenues anticipated for the current uh, state fiscal year. So basically she's saying, I wanna add a lot of money and we're gonna allow it to be spent within the next year or two, and then we're gonna pay it off over a much longer period. But this will allow us to get a bigger jump start on meeting unmet needs for housing than we're able to do if we just rely on the regular budget process. Um, the governor filed what's called an emergency bill in January. And if you go towards the middle of my uh, presentation, you'll see that basically there was $110 million that she asked for for a variety of purposes, all related to housing. Um, the assumption is that she's gonna come up with a larger bond proposal that exceeds $110 million to present to the legislature in the very near future. I don't think it's happened yet, but it's expected to happen in the near future. Just to put it, the $110 million in context in the current state fiscal year, that is FY23, the year that's ending uh, in July, at the end of July, there was $884 million set aside for the Department of Housing and Community Development. So adding $110 million to that amount or whatever is actually in the budgets that are under consideration by the House and the Senate now is not a huge ad. 
So my hope is that when we actually see the final bond bill that the governor proposes, and we also see what the legislature does with it, and hopefully the legislature would add on to it, it's going to be quite a bit larger than the $110 million that the governor proposed or included in her immediate needs in uh, her January proposal to the legislature. So basically, we've been talking about the need for money. And by and large, when people think about the need for money, they expect it to come through the state budget process. Just go back up to the top again, please. Uh -huh. Thanks, Nate. That's what they expect. And uh, in fact, this isn't unusual in state government. The governor has basically said, we really have a crisis in housing. And so we need to boost our budget much higher than what it otherwise would be. And we're going to do that through a bond issue. So that's kind of the basic story. And we'll see what the governor actually proposes and then what the advocacy groups um, urge the legislature to do on top of that. So the next question that I wanted to address is, how does Amherst benefit from this? Well, basically Amherst benefits when we put out uh, an RFP and we bring a developer in to develop a piece of property in the town that would be for some form of affordable housing. For example, we currently have a project getting going on East Street and Belchertown Road. It's a project for both sites combined. That project went to Wayfinders and I'm not quite sure exactly where Wayfinders is in the process, but basically, they will apply to the Department of Housing and Community Development for money in order to fund that project that would add something like uh, 70 plus units of housing, most of which would be affordable in Amherst, uh, the site of the Old East Street School and the Belchertown Road site. So basically, when there's more money in the budget, it means Amherst can benefit if we have projects in the pipeline. So we have one project that um, should definitely benefit. Nate can tell me uh, exactly where that project is in the pipeline. Um, but uh, I think it probably has a little ways to go before it's funded. By contrast, we have a project that is almost complete. And that's the one on Belchertown, uh, not Belchertown, on Route 9 um, near the Amherst College uh, athletic fields. And that's a project for Valley Community Development where they are putting up uh, 26 studio apartments that are for low income or very low income individuals. So that's a project that's already been in the pipeline. They got it funded by the Department of Housing and Community Development, and they've been working on it and they're very close to completing it. Laura will probably give us a better update than I'm offering right in a few minutes. So the point is, and the reason that we need to support the housing bond bill is because it represents a huge jump in additional money that should be available in the Commonwealth, some of which would trickle down to Amherst if we have new projects in the pipeline. So we need to do that. We need, for example, to get the VFW uh, hall into the pipeline. So we have studio apartments as well as a location for a permanent shelter in downtown Amherst. And we need to think about getting other projects online that can take advantage of any money that's available. If we don't have those projects in the pipeline, then when this money shows up, unfortunately, we can't take advantage of it. Um, I should also say that this money really is available for what I would say are larger projects. 
individual projects like the work that uh, the Amherst Community Land Trust does are not eligible for this funding for better or for worse. I also have one thing to just mention here uh, related to the alphabet soup of government. The Department of Housing Community Development has been split into two agencies. So the agency that is now relevant, that is that supervises housing development and gives out contracts and grants to developers is now called the Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities or EOHLC, which is a bit of a mouthful, um, but that's the new language. And that's the language that you may be hearing as people come up to speed with that. So this is an item that is not part of the main budget, but is important for us to be advocating for, um, depending upon uh, what we see and what we'd like to see in the governor's uh, final bond bill that she proposes to the legislature. Okay, let me go down to the second page where I have two items that are changes in statute. John, can I just ask you, is there some particular oh. ask about the first one that you want us to do right now? Or is this just information that we should pay attention to going forward? It's it's the latter, really, Carol. OK, all um, right, go ahead. You know, I, I'll try and bring back more information when I have it. But the bond business is a complicated business. And so I decided not to wait until we have more information, but to introduce it to this group today and then hopefully come back with more information in a month or so when hopefully we've got uh, the governor's further along and what she's proposing. And we have some idea about the advocacy groups and other members of the legislature would like to see an additional funding. Great, thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so here are two pieces of legislation. They aren't new pieces of legislation. They've been around for a number of years and they've been reintroduced. The first one is promoting access to counsel. And that, as it says, is intended to provide legal representation for tenants and quote unquote owner occupants with low incomes in, a, in evictions proceedings. So basically right now, landlords have access to counsel, uh, not necessarily all of them. The uh, low income landlords may have the same problem as low income tenants, but that's a relatively rare occurrence. Most of the time when there's an eviction proceeding, the landlord shows up with counsel and the tenant does not. So this is a, uh, uh, basically a promise or would be a promise by the state to assist te low-income tenants and avoid evictions to the extent that that's possible. So that's one piece. And again, that's that's a current piece of legislation that's under consideration. <laughs> the other one has to do with eviction ceiling. Um, basically what that means is when someone's evicted, um, that becomes part of their quote unquote permanent record. So for example, if you've been evicted and then you try to apply for some new housing, the landlord can look back and say, well, wait a second, you've been already evicted the last time you had housing and I'm not gonna offer you housing as a consequence. So, and, and that doesn't necessarily apply to the tenant alone. It can apply to anybody else who was living with the tenant who was named on the lease, including children. So there may be children living with a parent, the parents evicted, but the eviction record can also attach to the children, which means that when they come of age and they're looking to uh, look for housing, they are obviously disadvantaged by having this eviction on their record. So sealing basically means that the record of eviction 
is not available as to landlords or others in the public domain. Um, and so it improves, obviously, then the chances that people are going to be able to find housing because they're uh, a new landlord won't say, oh, you've been evicted. You're a poor risk for me. I'm not going to offer you this uh, rental. Um, so again, this is something that's been around for a while. And hopefully it will pass this time. Um, I, I think it's something that is worth the legislature's considering. I think it's something they should act upon. Uh, that's my own judgment. So that's why I brought it here today. So those are my two additional uh, pieces, um, legal representation and eviction ceiling for uh, people who are, are at risk of losing their uh, apartments or their housing. And so would the ask of us here be that, again, we write um, letters in support of these two uh, yes. things? We would write letters in support of these two things. They would go not only to our elected representative, Wendy uh, Dom and Joe Hummerford, but also to the chairs of the re relevant committees, ideally to the Senate president and the uh, um, the House leader. And yeah. so they're aware of the fact that there is general support for these pieces, um, at least in Amherst and presumably other people will write in too. Because as I said, these aren't new pieces of legislation. They've been introduced and reintroduced probably, I'd say, at least two or three times, maybe more often over yeah. the last four or five years. So the question to us as a trust is, is there some kind of, does somebody want to make a motion and then we can discuss it? Do we want to, again, we did this before, last time John brought things, do we want to write letters as he has suggested in and all the with all the right people in support of these two measures i see a thumb <laughs> up is there make anybody a motion that we write a letter on behalf of the trust in support of these two bills I thank said. you grover from motion motion from grover and was that erica Yes, I second, second. Motion. So is there some discussion about this? Does somebody anybody have any comment? Ashley. Yeah, I'm I'm fine with you know more money coming into the pot. That's absolutely fine. I just want to give one example is that I do I live in North Square apartments, which has 20% affordable housing, and each unit is costing five hundred thousand dollars to make. So it's like that's a million dollars for a million dollars you get two units and so it's good to have more money coming into the pot it's that working with developers amherst town worked with beacon properties to create 20 percent affordable housing in north square apartments it's costing millions upon millions upon millions just to get two units or you know 26 units if we don't do something about the cost of developers, we're not getting very far. I want I want more money coming in, but I really want to think about who we're working with and where the money is going because Beacon Properties is a multi-billion dollar probably, you know, developer, Wayfinders maybe not, CDC maybe not, but they are still costing us so much to get 10, 20 units. If we don't bring the so, cost down, we're not getting much. So I'm gonna, I would like to not continue that conversation. If there are comments about the proposal that's on the floor right this minute, we can come back to that later, but I would like to finish the conversation about the proposal on the floor, which is to support these two things with a letter. If someone wants to speak to that, Risha, please speak. Hi, um, yeah, so I support this. I, I would just, as a matter of process, 
I do better when I have some time to read the legislation and really dig in and consider and do the research and understand what, you know, all of the ramifications of things. Um, so it would be great to have some of these ahead of time to read, and then we could, you know, have a conversation about it uh, at these meetings. But I struggle when we approve things on the spot, and I don't feel like I always have full information. This seems like a really straightforward, you know, I, I support both of them. I'm happy to vote yes on all of them. But as a, as a process, I make that request. Thank you very much, Risha. We are trying to work at having that happen better, and we'll continue to do that. It's a very good suggestion from, from my point of view, too. So um, is there any other commentary? Um, in that case, uh, is there, do I have to vote by, oh, I will just go around and vote. So, uh, Erica. Yes. Carol, yes. Ashley, you're muted. Yes, I'm Thank fine you. with the water. Okay, Grover. Yes. Uh, Allegra. Yes. Rob. Yes. Risha. Yes. Okay. So we have, I think that that means we are done with that particular item on our agenda. Uh, I'd like to thank John for his service and look forward to what we hear from you next about the bond bill. Um, thanks for your, your good work. And move on to the thing on our agenda, which is called the discussion of trust priorities and a possible second CRC meeting, which I'm hoping will be kind of, it seems to me, it seems to Erica and I, but I'm going to say this, uh, in thinking about this, that the way we would like to look at our priorities is to actually engage with ourselves in some kind of strategic planning process that is more than a two hour meeting that is an actual opportunity where we all get together on zoom or not we can decide that there are all kinds of difficult things like that that would need to be decided but we look back at our previous um strategic plan we look at all the things that are already in place in town about what in the world we're trying to do what the trust decided it was going to do to build 250 more units a while ago how many of those have we built we would like and and all the information that we just gathered from the listening session we would like to have the opportunity to really think about all of that and come up with a have a better process for trying to decide what we want our priorities to be as the way that as the way that we get into a conversation about priorities that's our uh suggestion anyway and so uh, i'd like to open the floor for comments and thoughts uh allegra so i guess kind of going off what risha had just said I, I think it's an important conversation to have, but I think there needs to be the padding to have it. And I think part of that padding is the, the report from the listening session. So I don't know if we're just having a discussion about having a discussion tonight, because I don't think That's that the right. actual discussion could be had. Yes, I agree. I, if, if, I, if I didn't say it right, I, I was suggesting that we need, it's a bigger than we can do in just having a discussion right now. We need to have those materials. We need to have a chance to look at them uh, beforehand. And I would prefer that we have like half a day or something that we have set aside for ourselves to try to really think about this stuff. It could be in, in person or Zoom, we can decide. Uh, but I think it's not something that we can do in one of these meetings. It just always gets squinched and not. And so I agree with you. We need stuff that we don't have right now this is a proposal to plan to do a good job of it. That's what we're kind of, or I mean, Erica and I having talked about it, would like to do that and are right now entertaining uh, comments and whether people think it's a good idea or what anybody wants to say. 
Yeah, so I think that would be a good idea. Just what how you packaged it. I, I was like, I don't want to have that discussion tonight. We have a very full agenda. And that's like a big discussion. I'm with you. Absolutely. Yes. That's yeah, right. Um, so anybody else? Any other trust? I see Nate has his hand up, but let's see. Nat, why do I keep calling you Nate today? I knew somebody named Nate once. Anyway, does Nate. anyone else on the trust have a have a comment or or else I will ask Nat? Uh, I, I, I was just gonna say, um, we oh. have met with the CRC. We have so much information from the listening session and we all have very, I think, um, a range of opinions of what our priorities should be. It will be very important to spend, as Carol said, uh, at least three hours together, not only to look at all the different alternatives, but then we have to whittle down what we agree as priorities and maybe priorities in year one, priorities in year two, priorities in year three. And that's gonna take time. And it's gonna take a facilitator to help us through that. Um, so I absolutely agree with you, Carol. Let's think about planning it. Nate. Hey. Sure, no, I was gonna <clears throat> kind of say what Erica said. I think, you know, we can get all the documents and resources together. And, you know, I think if it would be over a series of a few meetings and we could have someone, we could have a consultant help. I mean, this is really formulating another strategic plan, but, you know, we could talk about, you know, getting resources and documents. We can post them online. They can be available to everyone. And then it's like, you know, having the trust members maybe get their own ideas, but, you know, having, you know, it could be that, you know, we have, a series of meetings every other week or three meetings in one month and it's dedicated to to this topic and um you know and, and we could hire someone to help facilitate that and I, I think it would be you know first kind of gathering everything um maybe even talking to the crc again or the you know the co-chairs could just to determine okay here's what we're you know what we're thinking um there are a number of documents and ideas but i think yeah, I, I, you know, and it could be like short, long-term, medium goals, things that we can advocate for. So, I mean, I was going to say, you know, what I heard during the listening session and as I've talked to different staff about it is there's, you know, there's no central application for housing. And, you know, that's not something that trust can solve, but is, is that a bucket in advocacy or something else? Do we work with wayfinders or RAAs to come up with a better system so someone could submit one application, like a common core application or whatever it is for um, college, but you know, have it for housing and streamline it because it just seems crazy that it's so repetitive and redundant and time consumptive. But you know, those are the things that could become ideas or we talk about and then we figure out how do we organize them thematically and by time range. But I do think you know, the trust has funding to hire someone to do this. We had um, Jennifer Golson wrote the first strategic plan and for instance, Someone like her or Pioneer Valley Planning Commission could come and help the trust over a series of a few meetings. It wouldn't necessarily be a large contract for them and they could really help shape the discussion. So if we don't talk about it tonight, I think at the next meeting we could say, okay, do we reach out to a few just to get ideas for what that, what the cost is and what it would look like? Uh, Risha. Sorry, I struggled with the buttons. Um... And now I have lost what I was going to say. Can you come back to me? Can we come back to you later? Yeah, that's okay. Uh, um, when you're ready to talk, maybe you should just talk because I don't know how to know when to come back. Uh, is there someone? I, so I've just heard from Nate a, a, a slightly different suggestion, having multiple meetings instead of having just one meeting. And I can think there might be things that would be an advantage to that too. I think maybe what we need tonight is an agreement that we want to do this in some way and a couple of people who are, who are willing to try to do a little put a little more into planning trying to see who who we could get to help us as an aided suggestion and um putting a little more effort into figuring out what it might look like and bring that back to us that's what seems to me like it might be a good thing to come out of now and risha do you know what you want to say I do. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask what the implications are around open meeting laws for this. Um, how how do we engage people in the process? Are we allowed to meet for three hours? Uh, how does that work? 
I presume that because of the open meeting law, it will be an open meeting. I mean, that we will have to let the public know about it. If people want to come, they will be able to come. It will work just the, like this, except that it will be except it will be about the thing that it's about and we will pr we'll probably entertain hearing from people if they have things to say as we do with this nate correct me if i'm getting something wrong but it will be subject to the open meeting law and we will have to make the public um be welcome in whatever way that we do it okay thanks um anything else ashley um, this might be, you know, part of the talk, but you know how there's 849, you know, affordable use, uh, affordable housing units in all of Amherst. I don't think I've ever seen a breakdown of how many that are Section 8, how many are 80% AMI, how many are 50% AMI. And it would be good to have that information to know that there may be a very, very, very small amount that is less than 30 percent ami and section 8 and so that needs to be called attention to we just we don't have a lot of information about those 849 house, housing units that are affordable to make a decision about what is needed we don't have the breakdown of what what's already been done that's a good that's something yes to try to get i know that uh, nate and george were we have a beginning of a list. They were trying to put more columns on it. Uh, so I believe that there's some work which may be kind of a little stalled right now, given other things that are going on. But yes, that would be great information to get. I agree. I agree. That makes that makes a lot of sense. Uh, other comments? Well, then can we get at least a sense of is this a is this a good idea, a bad idea, a eh idea? If somebody Risha doesn't have her picture on, so can we at you can just say yes, no, or yeah. something. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Well, it looked like we have some interest in going forward with this. And um I'm willing to try to think about it some more and work on bringing something back and uh if there is there someone or ones who would join me in that maybe erica at least <laughs> uh it's certainly um yeah absolutely yeah, and, and if there's anybody else who wants to who wants to join us i'm sure we're gonna have at least three people talk about planning to do something together so if there's anybody else who wants to speak now or or decide later or whatever so anyway we'll bring something ashley it's just that so this is separate from us meeting with the crc first right this is not because we need that meeting probably first to actually ask for and then actually get the information that we're going to need to have these meetings anyway because it's you know we've been waiting a long time for what's going on with these 849 I units we don't know we don't I don't know that there's something I don't know that there's something we need to meet with CRC about before we can do this. It seems to me that there's information that we have that we can gather that we can ask for. I don't think we I don't see us needing a meeting with them before we try to figure out more about what our priorities are in the context and in the light of the things that the housing. What is the name of it? The housing thing that they that we looked at with them that is there that's the town adopted as its housing policy in that context so well i would i guess i would like that information before we meet to think about our priorities because that will okay. that will like inform what our priorities yes. are but I, but we have that or we have had it and we can and we will bring it to this we we have it and we will have it and we will bring it do um, we have anything we have that already so we looked at it when we met in. with them when we met with the crc i'll send a link out to their packet it was um may but that 18th. didn't break it down that did not but, break hey, it hold down on. It, was, it was may 18th and there's um six or seven documents in there in the packet with links to the other documents right so we have 
the town's comprehensive housing policy. We have the trust strategic plan. There's a number of documents I think trust members need to look at and then come, you know, prepare to discuss and have additional questions. And so, uh, you know, to me, that's the starting point. Uh, you know, what are the other resources we need? What are the questions we have? And where we go from there? Um, and I'll, I can send a link to that, to their, uh, to those documents. Thank you. Yeah. And that, that doesn't answer the question of how many 30, that's, we not. know that, no, <laughs> but it, but meeting with them isn't going to answer it either. That's something that needs to be worked on, but it's separate from all, from the other things that we're, we're trying to get. To get to go, Erica. I was just going to clarify exactly um, what Ashley is asking for is data and deep dive data, data in order for us to then uh, go from data to action. So I just wanted to clarify. She wasn't asking about the comprehensive housing plan. Um, she was asking about the data. Okay. And I, I just tend to think it helps to have the CRC ask for it because when we ask for it, we don't get it. So maybe whatever whoever needs to ask for it that is effective in getting that broken down of the 894 units by what kind of unit they are whatever works works but we need that okay. before we go forward um anything else that someone thinks we need or should have or whatever then i am going to continue to we'll continue to work on this bring something back next time and yes we know that we need data as ashley and erica have said so Carol, i just, just want to yeah put my hand in i would be happy to join you and erica and planning in the meetings to plan the meetings great thank you so much all right we will be in touch um Okay, so and now I think we are ready to move on to Erica, who is going to have us vote on our chairs or whatever. Yes, so at the last meeting, um, we've actually raised this at two different meetings. One, just uh, introducing it, I believe, in May, where we agreed that um, we should annually vote in um, the chair or uh, co-chair. Uh, and what we agreed on uh, in June is that we would think about it and that we would then uh, vote today. So I'm asking if anyone would like to step forward um, to be the chair for the coming year, um, starting with September. Uh, August, starting with August all the way to next July, so full year. Um, if there would be anybody who would like to step up or step forward. I don't know if I lost all of you uh, because you're all frozen. Oh, they, I, they seem wiggly to me, but no one is wiggling in the direction of saying I volunteer. Okay. We could clarify that I think I'm, I'm willing to do this for another year, provided Erica will do it with me. Uh, if no one steps forward, then I'm willing to do it with you as co-chair. I'm not seeing any hands up, but my I, my whole screen's frozen. So please, um, if if you want to step forward or if you want to say something, just just go ahead. Just want to give a few more minutes. I nominate Carol, Carol, and Erica to be co-chairs. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Okay, so we've had one nomination. A second nomination. Okay, I think that was Allegra. Thank you, Allegra. Okay, so should we have a vote? I'm going to go sure. ahead and ask for a vote. Um, so, Ashley? That's fine. Risha? Yes. Grover? Yes. Allegra? Yes. Rob? Yes. Carol? Yes. And I say yes. Thank okay. you very, 
much. Um, and both Carol and I, um, sometimes we can't respond in an email, but we read every single email you guys send us. Um, so please continue to do so. What you raise is so important. What we do is we bring it back to this meeting just to make sure um, we're in compliance with open meeting law. So don't think that if we don't respond, it's not that we are not paying attention to it or we're not reading it. We read everything. And um, your feedback and your participation is so important in terms of the success of our work here. So we want to thank you and we want to thank you for your support. So back to you, Carol. So back to me. What are we doing next? Oh, a financial report, I think, right? So I think that if Nate can put it up on his screen, this financial report won't take very long because not very much has happened to the finances recently. But let's look at it anyway. <clears throat> Ooh, it's, oh, I made my screen so it's tiny, so. How visible is that, if that's, is that, I don't know if that's legible to. To me, it's visible. It's mostly okay. Anybody else? Uh, it might be too. Oop. Oops, no. no. Yep. So, I don't know. I mean, what, the, what I noticed about it was that all of the, real, most of the numbers are, exactly the same as they were except for we made a little interest and we spent a little bit of money on maintenance for belchertown road and so nate do you have what, what else do you want to say yeah no there hasn't been much change you know i do anticipate that uh valley cdc um was you know considering requesting funding from the trust for the ball lane project you know wayfinders may also come and uh request funding and so Although it looks like there's a significant balance, you know, if each of those developments requests a few hundred thousand, then it, you know, all of a sudden the trust could have, you know, a hundred thousand dollars or two hundred thousand dollars, you know, whatever it is. And so, um, you know, I think the idea of continuing to try to capitalize the trust through CPA or other funding mechanisms is important. Um, we know that housing is expensive. You know, it's we could try to say we're going to get the cost of housing down, but that's a a really that's a that's a really big um you know complex issue not just related to affordable housing but construction and development in general so yeah i mean i don't i don't have any any um any necessarily comments i mean i will say that you know cpa account the the ones that have cpa behind them or after them you know there are unless they're just development funds which is the, the last account line, the other two technical services and consulting services, you know, sometimes the trust has requested funds for a specific thing. So, you know, consulting services would be if we wanted to hire someone to help with a strategic plan, if we wanted to hire someone to do wetlands or property assessments, um, I mean, it can be pre-development funding. Development funds are kind of just general. You know, the trust has them, could use them for a number of purposes. Uh, the one, uh, caveat is it has to meet the income guidelines of the CPA, which is 100% uh, of AMI. So there is some flexibility there, but we couldn't use CPA funding necessarily to do, you know, something that wouldn't uh, follow those regulations, unless you could somehow justify that it was supporting affordable housing, right? So, you know, the trust could own market rate housing and then take the rent from, say, rental income and then somehow subsidize housing could get complicated, but um, anyways, I don't think we're in danger of that, but you know, most of the money is from CPA. There is one non-CPA account and that was donations and some carryovers from previous accounts. And so the trust can also get, accept donations or other things, interfaith housing provided funding. And so the trust, if there's ever capital campaigns or other funding that came in, it would go into this um, unrestricted account. And so we separate, you know, each account by by source. And so, I, mean, I guess that's kind of it. Um, I have two questions. One is, I assume that the most recent CPA award, because it's for some time in the future, that two hundred fifty thousand dollars isn't here yet. I can't remember if it's. So it's supposed to be for 2024 or something, the one that we just had approved. Yeah, I, you know, I can't, you know, when I did this, they may have already put it in because if the previously it looked like there was this odd um, balance when we looked at it in March. And I think it was because they hadn't put the CPA money into the development fund account. So 
but it says it was there in March. It says it's the same now. I, could you just clarify that and let me know or let us know, please? Because that seemed like an important thing to know. Yeah. As like yeah. So the, you know, so the trust is receiving money in FY24, which started July 1. The council voted it, you know, months ago, but the funding actually isn't available until July 1. And so, yeah, I'll see. I mean, this, this was done in June, so it may not have been there. So there could be enough, another, you know, a few hundred thousand, you know, 200,000 or whatever it is in the actual 250, stuff. I think it yeah. was. Anyway, that would be good to know. If it's already here, then that makes it, this looks, you know, I'm, I'm, I have been assuming that there's $250,000 that's not in here yet. So please let us know right, whether that's right. correct. And my other question is, which one of these things, if we decide to hire someone to help us with this planning process, which one of these lines can that come out of? I, I mean, I, could, I think it could be technical services or consulting services. Okay. I mean, or the unrestricted account, but I think okay. a few, yeah. Okay. Uh, Erica has her hand up. Yes. Uh, yeah, and I, I actually think it should come out of consulting because that's a pretty big line right there. But anyways, my question is much more is that we had voted on providing funds uh, for the listening session. I just want to make sure that we honor um, paying whoever I know Liz Haygood um, provided a lot of resources, and I know Allegra worked very, very hard with uh, UMass, and the UMass interpreters came, and they actually participated. So I just want to make sure that we get the, the money ASAP. I yeah. did submit an invoice. Yeah, once they submit an invoice, we can work on that. I'm working on... Um, to get reimbursements for, for Liz or people who paid and then with receipts, it's a little process with accounting. Um, and it was our fiscal year end as of um, you know, June 30th, so it's been really busy, but those are in process to get those taken care of. I think just my last, uh, sorry, I was gonna say my last comment is that we should really be careful about using unrestricted funds because that's the place that we have the most flexibility. Yeah. Um, Allegra, were you trying to say something or maybe you said it already? I just wanted to clarify because I believe that I'd sent invoices in, but if, if Nate hasn't received them, I will just make sure I send them again ASAP so that that can get processed. Was that from uh, UMass, Allegra? It, it should have been. It should be like UMass Translation Services Translation Center. Um, um. I'm pretty sure they sent it like the day after the event, so... I can just send it to you again. I'll just do oh, that. Yeah, to I do. I, I, I'm looking right now. Okay. You know, I was on vacation that following week, so it may may have been that I missed them, but I'm, I'll look. Okay. Any other comments or concerns or anything about the financial report? Hello. Yes, Ashley. I was wondering. Instead of having seven hundred and three thousand dollars just sitting in account, in an account, could we consider helping people with this money, like individual people that don't have their first, last, and deposit, people that you know won the lottery of having affordable housing in Amherst, etc. Could we spend money to help people with this money? Um, I think that this, I think it's supposed to be for development that the CPA, the cold giant CPA line anyway, um, is for what, development of affordable housing. So they, what about, what about the flexible money? So I think that, Ashley, so I think, yeah, CPA funds can be used for rental assistance or other things. And the trust had done that during the pandemic. I think we do, I would just be. You know, I think that's a bigger discussion for the trust. So, you know, if you provide first class security for someone, you might pro be providing seven to ten thousand dollars, and then you know, what's the what's the what's the upshot of that? Is it is it permanent affordability? Is it temporary affordability? And I think it's a really big discussion because you could eat through a lot of money really fast and not have any permanent affordable units. And so the CPA is already doing that. They are giving funding through to Amherst Community Connections to do rental subsidy. We provide we provide funding with block grant to family outreach and other organizations to do that. The town's using ARPA funds to do that right now. And so I think the trust could do that. And we have done that twice in the past, but 
you can go through a lot of money really fast. And so I think, you know, sometimes you limit it. Um, you have to also be careful with the anti-aid amendment with government funds going to individuals. And so it has to have certain purposes. But I think that is a program the trust has talked about. So could it be well, another local voucher or subsidy program? Could it be an emergency rental assistance or utility shutoff program? It couldn't just be, let's give money to individuals who, who need yeah, it. I mean, yeah. it, could be, it could be rental assistance, but it also could be to Craig's door, community action. It would be using money to help people, not just sit in an account. And that's personally why I'm here, because I would like to help people get into affordable housing that is almost nil, needs a lottery, and also sometimes takes $3,000 just to move in. I think we should consider helping people when we can. I, I think that's one of the things that we can put into our discussion of what our priorities are when we have it. We'll see how that, see how that goes. Yeah, no, what I agree. With you. I also Sorry. think, for instance, Valley has already said that they would request two hundred fifty thousand from the trust for Ball Lane, and so you know that's two hundred fifty thousand for thirty affordable home ownership units in perpetuity, or for say thirty years or something, and so. You know, if they, you know, and if Wayfinders wants another two hundred fifty thousand, there's not a lot left in the development funds. But perhaps the the result is that, you know, with Wayfinders, there might be forty five affordable units at a range of income levels for in perpetuity. So you you've with two hundred thousand dollars, you've secured forty five units for a very long time. So I think those are really important discussions to have with the trust. You know, how do we how do you spend the money? And so the trust had developed actually a kind of a funding guideline. It was a, it's, it's old, but I think I can, um, let me get a note to myself. I can send that around to the trust too, to have as part of the discussion in terms of priorities. What? Thank you. Yeah. So um, we do, that... so, so we do have, I mean, there's a, so all the funds are actually legal to give Craig's door community action, et cetera, et cetera. Or there's how much money do we have that is potential to like help people directly, whether it's a rental assistance, Craig's door, community action, whoever we give the money to, how much money do we have that is potential to do that relatively, you know, quickly so they can help ind individuals. I don't know. I mean, I really don't know. So maybe Nate, and as Nate has said, some things, some of the CPA money has different restrictions on it. Some of it, there's the rule about not giving money to individuals. So maybe we could give it to organizations to do something with. It's not what we've done before. And it's amongst our thoughts about what our priorities are to figure out the difference between that kind of help, like to Craig's doors or something. And what Nate was just talking about, about using the money to create affordable units that will be affordable for a long time. So it's 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 definitely at least a conversation about priorities. And in there, we should make sure that we know exactly which bits of money are available to use for what, but it's a priority issue. It's it's priorities also. So I I would like to move on if anybody else has anything to say about from looking at the finances, please raise your hand. Okay, then um, I'm going to I'm going to move on to the next thing which uh, people have brought up this is a discussion of whether we should continue to do meetings like this by zoom, or whether we should consider going back to meeting in person for for these regular meetings that we're having. And um, my understanding from Paul is that we can do that, but we we can't. It can't be a hybrid meeting. We are either on Zoom or we are in a room at town hall or somewhere in person. We can't mix and match those two things. It has to be one or the other. And he has also advised that it, if we switch to doing it in person, we should just continue to do it in person, that going back and forth between Zoom and in person is doesn't give the public the, the 
it makes the expectation of what's going to happen this time too complicated. And so we should either continue to do this or we should decide to meet in person. So, and unless we decide to meet in person, I will assume that we're continuing to do this. So if someone wants to propose that we should start meeting in person, uh, now is the time to speak. I, I think that it would be very important, particularly to do the strategic planning meetings in person, because that's kind of sets the tone for the whole year. And that's like kind of the most important part to be committed to in person. And then whatever Paul says, we can do whatever we want. <laughs> so we could do, we can go back to Zoom at some point if we want to, but it, if it's allowed to do either, we can just figure it out meeting per meeting, but particularly the strategic ones, whatever succession of meetings that is, I propose we do that in person at least. Yeah, there. Uh, so that's it. Ashley's proposing that strategic planning part of things be done in person, regardless of what happens on, with these regular monthly meetings. Is there a second or a discussion or something else? Anybody, Risha? Um, I'm really torn on this one, uh, and I'm wondering if there's. So I joined after things had already gone online. I've never been to an in-person meeting. Is there a difference in participation from the community between before and after, like on Zoom or in person? Well, that's a good question. There, are yeah, I mean, I was going to say, yeah, the I think Zoom is a lot more accessible to the community, and so right now we might have six attendees. Usually, we sometimes we have, I think, probably an average ten to twelve uh, walk, you know, a watch while we're live on Zoom, and then. You know the meetings get posted every Friday online, and then so sometimes I look at trust meetings and there's 50 views for a meeting. You know I don't know if that means someone watches the whole thing or they just open the link, but at least someone has opened the link. And so I will often feel questions or comments after meetings with people, you know, watching. So I do think that that's a really big consideration, right? So we sometimes have Representative Dom or you know Laura Baker's here, for instance, tonight. And so if we were meeting in person in the town room it puts them out a lot to try to come to a meeting. Um, you know, and then we wouldn't have any recordings. So all we'd have would be minutes. And so there would be no video or audio recordings would just be minutes. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think the planning board is having a few special meetings to do kind of some visioning. And so along the lines of what Ashley said, you know, maybe the strategic plannings in person, we, you know, I, I think, um, in, and if we were going to hire a consultant, we may want to ask them if how they would work. Is it better for them to be in person or um, remote? But I think remote meetings offer some flexibility for a lot of people. I mean, me included, I'll be honest, if we're meeting in person every month, I will miss uh, a number of meetings just because I have a lot of things going on in my personal life and other work life. So I usually have two night meetings a week, sometimes three. Um, and so to go back to being in person is a is a lot. So you know we'd also have to do paper copies of all the packets. Uh, we'd still put it online, but you know it'd only be available to whoever comes. And so the planning board actually had an in person meeting, two in person meetings this summer. And I will say, for one of them, one person came, and the other one, two people attended. It was hybrid, but most of the people still preferred it to attend over Zoom. So even though it was in person in the town room you know, all the attendees are still over Zoom. I mean, I don't know. It's just, do you come to a three-hour meeting in the town room or can you enjoy it at home and then provide comment when you need to? Yeah, I, sorry, I'll jump in again. But I, I completely, you know, recognize how much easier it is for us to, to attend. Um, you know, I have a kid in the background. I mean, that, that you know, I would have to have childcare and all of those things, but... Um, I also think that we've seen some of the downsides of not getting together in person. And so trying to figure out how to balance that. And I presume that Paul's recommendation is based on the fact that it confuses people, if meaning don't go back and forth often because people will, I mean, I, I have certainly been on other board meetings where people 
thought it was the other and they went to the place in person and it was Zoom or vice versa or, you know, and so it can get confusing to do it too often different, but maybe there's something in between where it's like a quarterly or every six months we do an in-person because it feels like this might have been too long without us ever actually, you know, meeting. meeting. Yeah. yeah. Um, anybody else who hasn't said anything have a comment to make? Uh, Allegra? Um, I, sir, I, you know, had the option on the table been hybrid, I would have definitely voted for that because I think people can be in person or people can be not in person and that then they can choose what works for them. But I think, I, th I think that having the recordings especially is something that I hadn't thought of. And I think that's super important. Um, it, it's interesting because in another committee I'm on, there have, you know, there has been talk about how detailed do we make the minutes? Oh, well, we can get the transcript of the Zoom call. So, you know, we can, you know, hit the bullet points, but really if anyone wants to go back, they can look at the recordings or they can, you know, get the transcript of the Zoom call. So I think that having like the, the recording is really important. I didn't think of that part of it. Um, but I, I do also think in terms of accessibility, there are pluses and minuses. Like I, I am also am here, you know, at 6.57, I was reading a bedtime story and at seven o'clock <laughs> I was here. And that would not be the case if, if I had to hop in my car. And um, so I think, I think for me, it would be, it's more convenient to meet remotely, but it's also, you know, I do think that the, you know, kind of as Ashley said, we're like, we're, these are people that were, impacting by our decision making and like we all are a group of humans and it's weird to just talk at a screen sometimes but I do also think the consistency is key you know, whether it's here this way or in person um so yeah I mean I think I would lean towards staying remote for a little bit longer but I do think that like the strategic planning should be in person I think that would be a you know an important meeting to meet for Grower. Uh, I just echo what Ashley and Allegra said. And Can you speak up a little? <clears throat> yes. <laughs> I echo what Ashley and Allegra said. And I think if we keep our regular meetings, our Thursday meetings on Zoom, but, you know, meeting you all a couple of weeks ago, or most of you in person for the conversation was great and can we I don't think it's that confusing to be like our planning process and special events are in person and our regular monthly meetings online that that would be my preference um I think that I have heard no one suggest that we should change our regular meetings to in person and so I think that this issue is no longer an issue I kind of raised it because I've heard a lot of people talking about it. So I thought we should make a decision since we can now. I believe that I am correct in saying that we have decided that our regular meetings will continue to be on Zoom and we will do a strategic planning thing that will be in person. And we may do other things in person. We will decide as we come up to them. But what we are going to keep doing right now is these meetings will be on Zoom. Am I correct in my assessment of what we're agreeing? Yes, but Nate has the hand up. Okay. In that case, I think that I get to turn it over to Erica. I guess I would like to ask one thing first, since I was supposed we were supposed to be only at like 845 or something. I, I think that <laughs> it may take us until 915 tonight, perhaps, if people can do that. Um, that would be great. Thank you. Erica. Uh, Nate still has his hand up. So oh, sorry. Hope. Oh, yeah. I was going to say that, you know, we could have the trust get together or trust members get together. As long as you don't talk about trust business, you can get together in person. So, you know, the concern would be that all of a sudden people start talking about housing, but it's like you could, you know, most trust members could say, like, let's go meet at Kendrick Park and just spend an hour talking together or whatever. It's, you know, it doesn't, it's not, doesn't, it, it won't be a posted meeting. And, you know, so I, 
I don't want people to be afraid to talk to one another outside of a meeting, but you just can't be, you know, start talking about things we nor normally talk about here. It, it, it can happen. Um, I just want to put that out there. And I do think that, you know, if we wanted to meet, say, right, three times a year in person, it could be either a special meeting or we could just post it as a meeting. It doesn't, it can be pretty light and on the uh, topics. It could just be, I don't want to say a get together, but it could be something where maybe it's like three times a year we have check-in and it's strategic planning, but it's talking about where we are, goals and other things. And it's a simple agenda, but it, you know, anyways, it, it could be something that helps facilitate discussion with amongst trust members. It doesn't have to be like hitting seven topics or eight topics. It could be, you know, a one topic agenda and that's it. Thank you. So I'm going to go ahead and move because it's 855 and I'm sure some people may have to leave. Um, so uh, since Laura Baker is here, maybe um, Carol, do, do you want to invite Laura just to give an update on East Gables and Ball Lane? Laura, ahead, do you want to say something? Here Hello, you are. Everyone. How are you? <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can. We are well, thank you. Glad you. Well, at least I am. I'm I shouldn't speak for anybody else. You know, here I am. So yes, I would love to give updates. Um, I also was curious because I talked with Carol at one point about the trust coming for a sneak peek tour at East Gables, but then I didn't hear a time. Um, but we are approaching 90% completion at East Gables. We had a scary setback with switchgear, which is electrical stuff, but we've worked around it. Um, we're anticipating completion uh, around September 20th and that folks could move in the very end of September or more likely in October. Um, so we will be wanting to showcase the property as much as we can between the time that it's mostly done and when it's occupied. Um, we had the lottery. Um, it took place on June 21st. <clears throat> we had 501 applications God. for the, we, it's 28 studios, but two are closed referrals from the Department of Mental Health. So it's really 26 studios that are available to people who enter the lottery. Um, I did, uh, we're doing a data breakout of who applied that I will share with the trust. Um, and I will tell you, it is um, interesting and stark, uh, both. Uh, I think 280 of the applicants were unhoused. Uh, about almost 400 of them were in that 30% AMI, the lowest um, income category, like Ashley was, I think, referring to, is that there's this pressure point. You know, well, it's bad all over. <laughs> there's some parts of our housing system that are, are just under tremendous duress and it's at the lowest level and it's also um, about 20 percent of the applicants i think met the local preference um requirement so it's really interesting data and i think um again we'll just put it into a prettier format and i will share it around with you and with other stakeholders who i think might be interested in seeing it so you know we always want to have plenty of people to move in you know, it's it's very sobering, honestly, to have that many applicants. For really? It's, it's, it's anyway. Um, and then in terms of Ball Lane, uh, we're chipping away. We did get the project eligibility letter, which will allow us to request the comp permit. Um, and, and I think Jess is anticipating maybe August that that comp permit will go in. And we'll keep you updated on that because we will look for people to hopefully be supportive in various ways um, with a letter or showing up at public hearings um, with the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, I think two things about Balling. We've done really good community outreach and it's not as probably controversial as East Gables was. So it's not that we won't have people with concerns, but it may not be the full press court <laughs> that we saw um, at, at East Gables on Northampton Road. So I'm happy to take questions and I'm happy to plan a time if you folks want to come and tour the well, 
I think we definitely, well, I, at least, definitely want to come for a tour, and I think that I'm not the only person. So, yeah, we would try to like, we would definitely like to work, I'm seeing lots of thumbs, uh, we would, we would like to work that out with you. Yeah. Could I, could I ask Laura a question? Yeah, Ashley. Go ahead. Yeah. Laura, Laura, would you be able to um, figure out, like, the, well, you know, the rents of each of the 28 apartments and then how much um, it costs each person to move in and to that apartment? Could you, would that be a fairly easy just Excel or, you know, yeah. spreadsheet so that we could know what the burden of each yeah. person is? We, we for sure know what the rents are. Um, okay. So 12 of the apartments of the 28 will have a, a project-based rental subsidy, which means that the individual's rent will be approximately 30% of their income. And typically, if you have to pay security deposit and first month, for example, it's your portion. It's not the whole rent. Okay. So if the market rate rent is, in our case, I think the market rate rent for a studio is around, I think it's $818. But if you have a, a voucher and your portion is $250, that's the part that would be multiplied for you to move in. But I can, I'd be happy to get more specifics for you. And we are, our property management team is very skilled at help, helping people find the cash to move in. Like we do not turn people away because they don't have enough money for, for their, you know, I don't think we charge last month. I think we just charge security deposit in first months. And if someone doesn't have that, we know the resources where they can apply to get it. Okay, great. Yeah, so, I'd like to see, I'd love to see that kind of broken down because we don't have that for 849 and, units. And that I agree, it's a, it's, a, it's a huge barrier in the market rate sector for people and maybe in some other types of, you know, affordable housing. Um, we work really hard to not have that be the reason that someone can't move in. That's great. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll be we'll be in touch about a, a time. Yeah. Uh, we'll so find what, a time. You, what, what, you said between September 20th and October or something. Is that yeah. or sooner than that? When do you? You guys can come anytime. You can come <laughs> for a preview. So you are VIPs to us. Um, so what I've said is it's best to plan something around three in the afternoon. Um, we try to hit the end of the day when the, the workers are slowing down. <laughs> we don't want to get in their way. <laughs> and we can get civilians like yourselves onto the site safely, but it's still daylight. <laughs> so that's Sounds good. All right. We'll, we'll find a time. Us. Okay. You guys let me know. Find a time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great. Well, thank you. Nice thank to you. See you Thanks so much, Laura. Um, so we're at 902. So if maybe, Nate, can you give us a real quick update on the housing coordinator position, um, as well as uh, anything that we should know around a responsibility of landlords for following rental laws? I'll pick up the latter and then I think, I know Dave has his hand raised and he was gonna speak to a few oh, things. Oh, sorry, thank you. Yeah, the, um, I mean, you know, landlords are supposed to follow laws. so. I know sometimes there's questions about that, but we don't, you know, unless there's a complaint, the town isn't actively, you know, monitoring them or checking on them, right? So we don't go around asking them their renewal process for leases. And so it's actually really complicated. And so when I attended a workshop put on by community legal aid, it made me think that we need, you know, like a hundred more attorneys, unfortunately, <laughs> in this area to help people because it's like every type of housing situation could be different depending on your subsidy or what kind of lease you're in. Are you in month to month? Are you in a year, you know, whatever. And so, um, you know, if there are complaints, we'll look into it or help facilitate. But, you know, I, I mean, the assumption is yes, right? So we don't, um, you know, I don't, unless we hear otherwise, I don't, you know, I don't, you know, so if someone calls me, I can facilitate a discussion. The town really isn't meant to be an advocate. We can help facilitate. I can, I'll call landlords on people's behalf. I won't use names, but, you know, typically we don't get into the details. I don't need to know someone's income or things like that, but we can help, um, you know, facilitate a discussion. I did talk to a few property managers recently, and I said that <clears throat> I think tenants are actually reluctant to call 
owners or property managers. And I said, even if that could be the first stop, so they often call the town. And so I don't mind, you know, I don't mind being that, that uh, conduit. Um, but sometimes I think, you know, it, it is sometimes tenants may not want to call their property manager um, and have questions because they could be worried about, you know, what a reaction might be, even though there's not supposed to be any. But I think that, um, you know, I don't, if we hear something, we look into it, but otherwise I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, you know, people will be pretty vocal if they think something is wrong. Uh, do we want to bring Dave in or can you speak to the housing coordinator position? I think Dave was going to speak to that and a few more updates. So I, we can allow, we can bring him in as a panelist. Thank you. Sure. Dave, you have the floor. Yeah, good evening, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. No, it's been a, a, an interesting meeting listening to you all. Good discussions. Um, I do apologize. I had hoped that we might get on earlier in the evening, and I have a, a family commitment coming up here in a couple of minutes. Um, so I don't think we'll be able to go through that whole list. I'm happy to come back, and maybe we could front load some of these town updates earlier in your next meeting. Um, I don't have that date uh, in my head right now, but I'm happy to come back and spend some time with you. I think you know the, the list of, of updates that was on the agenda is, is a good update. And I, uh, Nate and I talked with the co-chairs about coming monthly, and I'm happy to come monthly and give you all an update on where we are with various projects um, on that list. Um, in terms of uh, the recruitment for the housing planner, um, our goal, I think, we work through with Carol and Erica some issues related to uh, um, number of hours and you know what we wanted to, to uh, um, offer this position, and we're working with our HR department now. I expect to have somebody on board, I would think, within 35 to 40 days. Um, the HR department has been short staffed for quite some time here at, um, in town, but we're back up to full, uh, full, uh, full staffing. So that's great. And um, we have a number of vacant positions in, in town, including the housing planner. So um, we should have that position, I hope, filled by late summer. And I'm happy to give other more thorough updates on VFW and um, some other uh, potential projects. Uh, I was listening to John earlier talk about things in the pipeline, and we can talk about some of the other projects that we hope to have in the pipeline. Um, so the next meeting is August 10th, and we can put you up uh, further up in the um, agenda. That's fine. And I am in town on August 10th. Thank you. Um, and as uh, Dave uh, alluded, um, we actually had our first meeting with Dave and Nate, and we will have a meeting um, a week prior to our meeting here um, and uh, make sure that we let Dave and Nate know um, all the different topics that we would like for them to speak to um, so they can be prepared to answer questions as well as um, give an update on all the different topics that we have on our agenda or any other topics. Yeah, and specifically on, on any of those projects that were on tonight's agenda, if, if trust members have questions, please get them to the co-chairs, and that way Nate and I can be prepared for your questions, or better prepared for your questions on August 10th. Thank you. Um, the, the last, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay, the last uh, town update item was the vacancy and um, what Paul, Paul was not able to be here this evening, what he has told Carol and I that um, it's in process. Um, so hopefully we will have an update from Paul soon on the vacancy. I think it'd be important to have the vacancy filled um, before we start our strategic planning so we have a full board um, and we are all on the same page in working together to identify priorities. Um, Erica, I have one or two more minutes. Can I give a quick VFW update? Oh, absolutely. We okay. would love it. Um, so very quickly, um, so you all know that the town took uh, ownership of the, of the VFW. Our facilities director, um, Jeremiah LaPlante, and our building commissioner are working on uh, next steps uh, with, with Nate and myself on that property. Um, next steps include, uh, we are cleaning out the building, the building 
was um, in, in difficult shape, I would say. Um, we bought it as is. Um, the VFW representatives and leadership took out what they wanted to from a historic um, a value point and also from the perspective of veterans from our community. And now uh, we are clearing out the building. We are doing a, 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 an environmental assessment of the building. Um, before you demo a building, you need to, to uh, understand what is in the building so that the demo um, uh, contract can go out, i.e. asbestos, anything else like that. Um, so after that, our next step would be to um, uh, contract four put out a bid to dem demolish the building. Um, we think uh, that's on the order of about $100,000. We have ARPA funds to do that. We're also moving toward a meeting or a series of meetings that the trust would, would hopefully be a part of, if, if you're willing. I, I, tr I trust you would be uh, in the fall, where we would call together stakeholders to talk about kind of visioning for what that shelter slash supportive uh, housing uh, project would look like. Um, uh, I've spoken with the executive director of Craig's Doors. I know I've spoken to Carol and Erica about the trust being part of that, and we would open up that uh, that discussion to the community. Um, that will inform what, what we hope to do is that would inform um, kind of a, a, a design element, a design charrette, if you will. We would bring on an architect to do some rendering, some modeling of what could go on the site. What, um, what, the, could, what would the site uh, hold in terms of the size of the building, the square footage, the height of the building, and we could get some renderings done of what that might look like. And that would be informed by the community charrette that we would hold in the fall. Um, let me see Nate jump in. Um, we're also beginning to uh, that, Charette and uh, working with an architect would begin to um, formulate a rough budget for the project. Um, I know speaking with Rob Mora, my you know early indications are this is probably a again seven to maybe fourteen million dollar project. Again, those are really rough early numbers, but some millions of dollars to make this happen. We also hope to do a field trip down to Father Bill's in Quincy, uh, uh, a similar project that um, was, was um, uh, created down in Quincy where, where they have a shelter with supportive housing, permanent supportive housing, and also uh, wraparound services and other services provided for those folks uh, utilizing the shelter. So Tim McCarthy has been uh, very supportive and wants to be part of this process, of course, with uh, Greg's doors, and I'm sure there'll be other folks. So that's kind of the update on the VFW. Um, you'll see the building come down hopefully later this summer, and then we'll have this charrette, I would imagine, in early October. So happy to take any quick questions if folks have them. Any questions for Dave? Yes. Go ahead, Ashley. Is this, um, like when we get to the point that you're hiring developers, can we have a discussion about like the finding developers, the process and opening it up to a far wider range of developers that are like, you know, want a chance and also take a much less profit margin than we traditionally use so that we don't use the same developers all the time. We, we open it to new, you know, entrepreneur developers and that are, cheaper and much more efficient. We can certainly look at that, Ashley. Um, when we say hire a developer, uh, typically the town is, is constrained by Massachusetts and federal um, pro procurement laws. So there is a very prescribed process by which we have to put out, I heard earlier in your meeting, uh, John Hornick referenced the RFP that was put out to, um, to uh, uh, bring in uh, Wayfinders. So, that is a similar process. We could certainly, you know, look into what parameters, what requirements we could put into an RFP like that that are legal. But um, we would have to fire uh, uh, follow Massachusetts pr procurement law to um, to do that. And to your last part of the question, we can reach far and wide um, to see who we could get. There's no real limitations on that. It's just they have to be qualified and they have to meet the requirements of the uh, request for proposals. 
Sure. Nate, if I, did I miss anything there, Nate? Nate's. Don't no, worry. no, but I think that, you know, it's a tricky thing, you know, do you, you know, you list qualifications. And so, you know, you, know, you might want to have a design team or a developer that has experience, you know, for instance, a big discussion is, is it, are they developing and managing it? Are they developing it and then handing it off to someone who will manage it? And so I think those discussions are really important because it, it changes who might respond. And so, you know, Greenfield went through a similar process just recently in terms of, who, who is actually developing supportive housing and who's then managing it? Is it all in one? Is it separate? And I think that becomes really important because, um, you know, I mean, what's the space used for, uh, you know, first floor, ground floor? Is there uh, shelter? Is there uh, drop-in day center resources? Is there, what kind of housing is above it? And then that really informs who would respond. And so typically you have minimum criteria you know, uh, you know, um, kind of, you know, three to five years experience, for instance, and then a few list a few things, and then you have comparative criteria that any proposal has to respond to. So it could be like we did with E Street and Belchertown Road, you know, the trust really wanted, um, say, more sustainability or compatible design. So you have comparative criteria for that. We could do, we had some for better affirmative marketing and reaching, you know, populations that wouldn't normally respond. And so those are the types of things that then become uh, how you re review the proposals. And so unfortunately, some uh, entities that may not have a lot of experience don't score highly in that, but they might score high in other criteria. So, you know, we try to come up with, a, you know, five to seven comparative criteria that are then reviewed across all applicants. And so, um, but I think there's some critical points in there about how do you structure it first? And so, you know, who's doing the permitting? Is it the person responding does it all? Is it, does the town do something? And so, I think there's so many, I think during the charrette and some of those concept designs, all these things could be discussed a bit. You know, what is the structure of all of this moving forward? I was gonna say that the town is also, we've also talked about with different agencies about funding. You know, John mentioned how to get funding for certain projects. And so we've, you know, we've discussed this project since the town's acquisition in terms of, you know, how do we get this, you know, say pre-development funding or what are other avenues to get things moving forward? Because it is a big, you know, it's a big price ticket for something like this. I do want to make it clear um, as we wrap here that the town is not a developer. We, you know, we we will not run the shelter. We will not own the, the shelter and the supportive housing. So we do need, as we have in other projects, we need partners and, and yeah, so... So the trust, no question, the trust. Uh, we we want to to collaborate with the trust and with Craig's Doors and other entities in the region, and we'll invite you all in uh, for that meeting or series of meetings in the early fall. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Um, again, I just want to uh, thank everybody because we're now at nine seventeen. So I don't want to cut the conversation short because it's really really important. But I think what I heard, which is really important, is is that there's going to be community engagement, including the trust being part of this, and we've got lots of members who have lived experience uh, and have lots of experience who would really like to be part of the process. So we will um, very intentionally uh, pay attention to the timelines and make sure that we, we, one of us or a couple of us are available um, throughout the whole process, including uh, we'd love to be part of the review of the RFR. Uh, in terms of the applications. So I'm just going to move it to uh, Carol to wrap up for the evening. I'm wrapping up for the evening. <laughs> are there any are there any announcements? Is there anything else that has to happen? I think I'm kind of feeling done. Has anybody got anything else that they want to can say? I, can, I just, can I just add that my um, Beacon Properties tried to raise my rent $121 and in between my lease term, which turns out to be illegal. And because I know to write to Nate, I did. Please tell everyone, you cannot raise rent in the middle of a lease term. And if you have questions, call or write Nate Malloy because he will tell them it's illegal and then they will not do it. So that's how you get your rent reversed is by knowing someone on the town staff and then calling them and writing them. We have to say that widely, otherwise they don't know. Thank you. Grover, are you have your hand up? No, okay. Uh, Nate, do you have your hand up? Yeah, <clears throat> no, I, I, yeah, Ashley, you know, did reach out to the town and then I reached out to Beacon. 
I do think, yeah, it's interesting. I, I've spoken with Beacon a few times about this. They, you know, I think that they did a, a, a you know, a letter to all Apple, um, all tenants. There was an error. They sent it to kind of property wide. Um, but we, I have talked to them about having better communication with tenants, especially in affordable units and trying to have sit down meetings at every um, lease renewal. And I, you know, I don't know if it's something they do or don't do, but it's just, it's interesting that if tenants don't know to ask the questions, then they don't know to ask the questions. And so, you know, I do think that the trust can be far reaching and we can do public outreach and education. I do think it could be worthwhile to have some of this available for tenants, whether it's, you know, we have a few meetings a year, we put more resources on our, our website, but, you know, I, don't, so I, you know, I asked, for instance, the, a few people at Beacon, like, well, you know, do the tenants call you? How many days notice do you give them? Can you give them more notice, you know, more than the required? It'd be great to have a sit down every time and walk over the lease. And so, you know, sometimes they have automatic, automatically renewing leases. So you sign once, if you're there for three years, you never sign again. The lease just automatically renews on your renewal date. You'll get a notice saying that it's renewing, but you don't actually see a new document. And so, you know, there's certain things that, it's maybe easy from a personnel standpoint or from a paperwork standpoint, but tenants may then not really know how to ask questions. And so, I mean, it's something that's constantly evolving. And I feel like, yeah, I mean, I don't, you know, I might not respond, right? Like, oh, I, my lease is renewing, sure. Oh, the raising rents, it's according to HUD guidelines, sure. But you could say, well, can you not raise them so much? Or, and they might not, like, you could actually negotiate with your landlord. They don't have to raise them the amount they're saying they're raising them. They want to, or they they are allowed to, uh, you know. Every year, HUD publishes guidelines, but it's just something that I feel like tenants probably don't know that they can advocate for themselves. And so, I, I think that's a really important piece. Thank you. Um, anything else before we adjourn? I think that um, I don't think we have to actually take a vote. Shall we adjourn? I make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> okay. We're voting with our thumbs or with leaving the meeting or something. Thank you very much. And thank you to everybody for uh, staying a little bit late. We had a lot of stuff to do. I think we got a lot done. And uh, we'll see you in a month. And who knows what will happen in between. Thanks a lot, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you.